All right. Sort of the underlying theme of um, a lot of the first couple classes um, is that HTML and CSS are the two languages that we're going to use. And we're going to use them hand in hand, and each takes on a specific role. The, the role of HTML is to put content on the page. And what do I mean by content? I mean text, um, headlines, headings, links, images. All right. And the HTML describes what the things on the page mean. In other words, an H1 indicates that that's a top level heading. That's what that text means. An A tag indicates that this is a link. That's what that link means. That's what that text means. It means it's a link. Whereas CSS is responsible for the appearance. All right. You should get used to thinking in those terms because that will help you a lot in terms of figuring out how to do something. So for example, um, there was a question towards the end of class last time such as, like, how can I indent stuff a little bit? Well, first thing to do would be to think. Now, is that adding content to the page, or is that changing the way the page looks? Well, that's cha uh, changing uh, the way the page looks. Therefore, it's something to be done via CSS as opposed to HTML. All right? They'll at least narrow down your search in half. All right, and that'll, that'll simplify things and, and allow you to find things a little easier if, if, if you can identify to, to start out with uh, wh where it is. Um, we do this for a lot of different reasons. And again, as I, as I believe I mentioned before in earlier classes, in, in most cases when I say do this because it's like a good practice to do this, the, the reason behind it is it helps the maintainability of the site. It's easier then to go back and make changes to it. And I want to show you a site that sort of illustrates that point as well as I think it can be illustrated. And this site is called CSS Zen Garden. And I'm going to bring it up. And what it is is this. It's one HTML page that designers from all over the world got together and design their own CSS file to make it look different than everyone else. So there is one HTML file. Every example, every page that we look at is the same HTML file with only one small difference, and that is they each point to a different CSS file. So let's bring this up and take a look at it. And really, you know, the results are staggering. And and in fact, it was created really to demonstrate to people the power of CSS. Yeah, I, this, this time I know. Sometimes, sometimes I leave the screen off just in case I would mistype a URL and have something ugly happen. All right, CSS Zen Garden. If you look at this, uh, let's pick a, a couple of sign points here that we can look at. Um, the beauty of CSS design, the road to enlightenment, a demonstration of what can be accomplished visually through CSS-based design. All right, And then they have a whole list of, of other pages. We can just go ahead and, and randomly click on some of these. These are other versions of that page, of this page. Now keep in mind that the HTML is identical. We'll see the same content on every one of these pages, but it will be styled differently. And the only way you can achieve this level of flexibility is by not using any HTML tags for appearance. So no center tags, no break tags, none of those tags, and do it all via CSS. Likewise, no HTML attributes uh, that contribute to the appearance. So here's another example. And I clicked on the wrong thing. Make them proud. There we go. All right. Exact same HTML, but a different appearance. And we can go here and click on that. Same HTML, different appearance. It'd be impossible to do this um, if, if there wasn't a very clean separation between the content in the HTML file 
and the appearance in the CSS file. All right. And this shows the flexibility. So what does that mean practically? Um, practically, um, look at it this way. Uh, I worked for a retailer, a jewelry retailer. Uh, I, I did a project for them. I didn't really work for them. I worked for a consulting company. And they wanted to change their color scheme seasonally. Right? So as Christmas came around, they wanted Christmassy colors. As Valentine's Day came around, they wanted Valentine's Day colors. As the summer rolled around, they wanted summery colors. All right? So they wanted to be able to change their colors uh, on their site, you know, with each season. Now, if we had done things sort of the old-fashioned way, where we use HTML for the appearance, we would have had to change a boatload of pages every season, right? Every time that changed. Instead, by using CSS, all we had to do was make a change in, a C in one single CSS file and the change was reflected throughout the site. All right? Um, so if your organization wants to sort of rebrand itself, you know, and use a different font and use different colors, uh, you know, that, that's easy to accomplish uh, if you, you put everything dealing with the appearance in CSS. Now, one thing I talked about was an external style sheet file. And um, you're required for Lab 2, I think, to use an external style sheet file. But I'm not going to spend tons of time talking about it in class. I want you to spend a little bit of time doing research on your own to figure out how to do it. The idea of an external CSS file is like this. Instead of having each page have its own style code, you put the style code in a separate file and then you sort of marry them up. You, you combine the, the CSS file with the HTML. And if we do a view source in this uh, case, we'll see an example of that. Whereas, It's accomplished via this link tag. Whoops, not that link tag, this link tag. Actually, not that one either. <laughs> yeah, it's actually done this way. That's not what I wanted to show. It's okay. It's just, let's pull it up real quick. Here's what I'm interested in showing. There's actually a couple ways to do it. This is the way that I'd prefer you to do it. Is via an external style sheet file. So you'll put your style code in a separate file and then you will um, link to it in your HTML code. So there's resources online that will show you how to do this. There, uh, it is in the book as well. Um, and you can poke through the book and find exactly where that is. Yes? I have a question. Uh -huh. With lab one, I did some work with CSS a little bit because that my page didn't take mm -hmm. that long for me. Right. Um, I think I even put it in the comment when I turned it in the lab block. I could not get the background colors to show up for anything. I changed all kinds of text colors. And okay. Uh, someone sent me an email about that. Did you? Okay. Um, one thing to do is, is if you, uh, background for example, is uh, one, one to check the spelling on. Because I have a lot of people that spell it without the G. They, they put in background instead of background. So double check your spelling would be the first thing to do. All right. Um, and, and if that doesn't work, then, then I can take a look at it. The question was, is the, the student couldn't get background colors to show up. So what I'm suggesting that they do, but they are able to do the font colors. That's a sign, by the way, that your selector's right because you're able to change something on the page, but you're not able to change a certain attribute. And in that case, usually you have the attribute spelled wrong. You have something about the attribute wrong. Um, that's a good, good point to bring up the larger point for is in troubleshooting, you know, one thing you should look for is are any of your CSS rules applying? You know, if not, then maybe you have an issue with the selector. Maybe you have the selector spelled wrong or something like that. Whereas if some of the style rules are applying but some of them aren't, then it's a problem with the, the individual attribute. Let me show you what I mean. 
because that might be a little vague. Let's look at um, the example from last time. If I can find it again. Here we go. Okay, there's the page that we had last time. Now, if in my style, for some reason, I spelled body wrong, for example, then you'll notice I don't get any style rule. But if I spell body correct, and I spell one of the attributes incorrect, then, so, well, yeah, this is a bad example because I do a color white. Let's change this color to yellow. Then it changes the, the, the text color, but it doesn't change the background color. So, again, look to see if any of your style rules are applying or not. You know, be careful about the braces, that you have the braces around them correctly and so on. Yes? Would uh, that be case sensitive? That is a good question. Let me try that. Nope. That being said, I would not tempt fate. I would, I would match the case that I was using. Um, we, um, later on we'll talk about uh, the case of tags. In general, it's better to keep the, the tags lowercase. All right, and tags and attributes or cases we move forward. Technically speaking, had you made a mistake and for some reason you had a caps lock on, as long as you have that going, it shouldn't be a problem. Uh, yeah, it doesn't appear that, that at least for this browser that there that there's case sensitivity. But it's something to check. Yeah, it's something to check, yeah. All right. Okay. Now let's make Let's see, what do we have next? Next thing I want to talk about are images and putting images on your web page. All right. Um, first of all, I don't know what happened to the recording here. Um, first of all, um, why do we put images on a web page? What's the, what's the uh, advantage with uh, putting uh, images on web page? What does that do for us? Hey, you can show something. Draws your attention. Mm -hmm. You can show that. Yeah, something's going crazy with my... Uh, monitor. It's on, is this a distance learning class? <coughs> yeah, well, but, but again, I, yeah. 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 Oh. All right, thank you. All right, so uh, we, we, we put images on pages for a lot of different reasons. Um, number one, you know, the old saying, a picture's worth a thousand words, you know. If I wanted to show what a tennis racket looked like, I could try to describe it to you. You know, it's about two and a half feet long. I don't know, is that about right? Three feet long? Something like that. Two and a half? Yeah. Probably less than three feet. So it's, it's two and a half feet long. It is... Um, made out of aluminum, um, its width is 18 inches, you know what I mean? It would be very difficult to do that, even a, even a common item, to really describe it. Instead, you just show a picture of a tennis racket, right? And, you, and you're good to go. So, in some respects, you know, a picture's worth a thousand words. Another thing is, is simply for, for visual interest, right? Um, in other words, um, you know, a page of just text gets boring after a while. It's nice to have an image there that sort of complements the text, that goes along with the text, 
All right? But, and even adds to it. And adds to the mood or um, whatever. All right? Um, so sometimes you do it for content, that it's better to have an image than to try to do it all in text. And sometimes it's just to, to look nice for decoration. Now, one thing to be concerned about, though, is, is the size of the images. Because the more and the bigger images you put on your page, the longer it's going to take to download. And download speeds are becoming faster all the time, yet that's still an issue. That's still an issue, the fact that you know, some people have slower connections, or their internet is slow on a given day, or whatever. You don't necessarily want to bog them down with images. So, you know, the old saying might have to be altered a little bit. You know, a picture is worth a thousand words, but it better be, right? Because otherwise it's taking up the bandwidth of more than a thousand words or something like that. I don't know, someone cleverer than me can, can put, put it in, in better language. So, what we're going to talk about is we're going to talk about images. And we're going to start out by just showing how to do an image tag. Um, if we wanted to put image on the page that was content, all right? In other words, I'm, I, want, I want this image to be content on my page, not just decoration, all right? We'll talk about the decorative ones uh, later on, all right? So, let's go and let's make a brand new page, all right? Uh, I know some of you have expressed uh, difficulty in, in creating the page and are unsure about Notepad or whatever, so we'll go over that again. Uh, you go up to and you go up to um, Notepad, start Notepad, and you can put in your basic tags, HTML and HTML. As a general rule, as soon as I put in a start tag, I'll put in the end tag, even if I have to leave some blank lines. So I'll put in the head, in the end head, the body, and then the end body. Then the title. Alright, we'll leave the CSF off, CSS off for now. We, we might put some CSS code uh, in there later. And I'm going to put an image. The image I want to use is also on the desktop. To start out, it's best if you keep everything in the same folder. Alright, so my web page I'm going to save on the desktop. So I'm going to save it as a .html file. I'm going to save as type, change it to all files, and I'll save it. And notice that the image and the HTML file are, are, are in the same folder. All right? The desktop is just really a, a, a folder. Right? It's a different kind of folder. So now I want to go and put an image tag um, on there. Now. The image tag is going to have attributes just like the A tag had attributes. If you remember, what is an attribute? An attribute is more specific information about the tag. In other words, with the A tag, we said we had a link. Well, we have to specify a link to what? All right, we have to specify what page we're linking to. Same thing with an image tag. I'm going to say I want an image here, but I have to say which image I want. I might have hundreds of different images on my website. I have to say which one of those images I want to appear here. So, the tag for images is the IMG tag. And the attribute that says what file we're going to use is the SRC tag for source. And we need to put in the exact name of the file that we're using. Now, I had talked in previous classes how you don't want to hide file extensions. So you want to go into Windows and not hide file extensions. You want to show file extensions. Um, that becomes especially important with images because 
it can be easy to get confused about what the full name of an image is. The full name of this image is Simba.jpg. JPEGs can also be Simba.jpeg. Just depends on the specific file and how it was saved. In addition, it could be another format. It could be a GIF file or it could be a PNG file. Generally speaking, those are the three file types you want to use for images. You want to use uh, JPEG, GIF, or PNG. Bitmaps, BMP files, you don't want to use. You don't want to use for a couple different reasons. First reason is that it's not supported by all browsers. The second reason is your file is going to be a, 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 a ginormous size if you use a bitmap file. You want to convert it to a uh, JPEG file. We'll talk a little bit about photo editing and converting photos and all that uh, in a minute here. All right. So I can do that. That's one attribute. There actually is a second attribute that we want to put on all our images. And that is an alt attribute. And what the alt is, this is an, it's an alternate description of what the image is. Now, why do we do that? We do that for a couple reasons. First of all, um, people that are accessing your website using assistive technology, for example, people that are blind actually use a piece of software called a screen reader that actually reads to them the contents of a web page. Well, the screen reader is not such that it can describe the photograph to them. All right. However, it's nice to put at least a little description of what the photograph is to sort of give an idea. You know, that it's not as good as being able to see the image, obviously, but at least that gives them an idea of what's supposed to be there. All right. In addition, if for whatever reason um, that image accidentally got deleted off of the web server, or someone is browsing the web and they, they said they don't want to see images, all right, they'll see the alternate text. Now on some browsers, if you put your mouse on an image, it shows the alternate text as well. So there's a few different reasons, but again, every image that you create should have those two attributes. The SRC attribute that says what file we want to display and the alt attribute saying the name, uh, not a name, but a description of, of the uh, image, again, for the reasons that I listed before. Now, there's nothing between the start and end tag for an image. <coughs> so, we could do this. Our start image tag and right after it our end image tag. But we're not going to do that because that's kind of a waste of space and it's a little confusing and all that. We can actually roll up our start and end tag all in one by doing that. This is what's called an empty tag. And an empty tag, this is the first example of an empty tag that we, we have. And what an empty tag is, is, is a tag where there's nothing between the start and end tag. So when you do it like this, that indicates that, hey, this is a start and end tag rolled all into one. You can't do this with other tags, right? At least none of the other tags that we've studied. Because with a link, there needs to be something between the start and end link tag. With a heading, there needs to be something between the H1 and end one. But for an image, there isn't going to be anything between the start and end image tag, so you can, you can take this little shortcut. Yes? Is that space actually, uh, yeah, there, there it is. You probably actually don't need it. I just, I just spaced it to make it a little more readable. You have to have this slash, yes, to be a start and end tag together. All right. Now, actually, you can, you, you, with images, you can only have a start tag, but, but that's sort of a bad habit to get into. So we're going to do, if, if it's an empty tag, we're going to do it this way. Now, if we go and look at this, we will see, see the cat. Right. And there he is. This is my favorite cat. He's unfortunately no longer with us, but he was my favorite of, of, of all our cats. He was uh, one that, that we took in uh, off the street. You can see he had a tough background. He had a little notch in his ear. Must have been in a little scrape, you know. 
But enough about this. All right, I'm going to start getting all misty-eyed, and you don't want to. You don't want to see that. All right. Okay. So that's an image. Now we can use this along with the other tags that we've done, right? We can do something like, you know, put an H1 tag and say my cats, because that's sort of the top level heading of this page. Maybe I could have another top level heading down there if I had dogs to say my dogs, but I don't have any dogs, so this will be the only H1 on this page. I could put then an H2 for each individual cat, so I could put an H2. Alright. And then I could put maybe underneath it, um, maybe a paragraph. Why do you have slash A? Because I am not paying attention to what I'm doing. Okay. <laughs> Actually, if that happens again, is because I'm testing you to see if you're paying attention. That's what I meant to say. I had an old teacher in, in grade school, fourth grade I think, and I know she nodded off at her desk. But she always claimed that she was testing to make sure that we would be behaving ourselves even if no one was watching. Uh, and, and the funny thing is, is I was in fourth grade and saying, oh come on, that's, <laughs> you know. I don't know who she was trying to fool. Anyhow, maybe she was, who knows. All right, let's go and put another image on here for another cat, a, a lesser favorite cat of mine. This cat was nasty, the next one I'm going to put up here. Yeah, yeah, she was. Yeah, yeah. We'll be generous today and say she was tempera, tempera, temperamental. I think that's spelled right. I don't know. Close enough. Did you find her fish? Yeah. Yep. Where do you find we, I, used to live, <laughs> I used to live by a park in Lorraine, so they found us. <laughs> pe pe yeah, well, people, people would dump off their cats in the park, and, and they would... They would spot a sucker, you know. Other cats probably, you know, uh, gave messages on, on the cat internet or whatever, and, and they found our house, you know. Okay. And... I'll never forget when we brought home some kittens. Those particular kittens were uh, dropped off at, at our vet's office and we took a couple of them in. Ooh, Cleo was fit to be tied. She, she did not want these new cats in her house. Alright, so there's one image, there's another. And yeah, don't let it fool you. <laughs> Alright, so there's the images. Now, I talked a little bit about editing images and, and things like that. For example, these images are pretty small. If I were to look at this, um, properties, this image is 52 kilobytes. And that's not really that big of an image. All right? But let's pretend I want to make it a little smaller. Let's pretend I think that's too big. All right, and I want to make it smaller. Let's talk about editing images and how we can do it. Now, there's a lot of different programs around that allow you to do all sorts of things with images. Is there anyone that, that, that you use? Any, any of you use an image editing program? Okay. <laughs> so I have no idea. Uh, I heard everything all at once. Could, one at a time, please. Yes. Photoshop. Photoshop is kind of the 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 uh, you know the one of the one of the industry standards in that yes I use, GIMP. I use GIMP all right GIMP is a free more or less equivalent of Photoshop um, the big selling point for GIMP of course is it's free so if you're looking at you know value for dollar free is is pretty good. And, and it is industrial strength, too. I mean, people use that for all sorts of things. Yes? Um, 
absolutely. The additional benefit is if you're so inclined, the GIMP is open source, which means there's a community of people, including yourself if you want to, that can develop and, and put add-ons add to it and, and extend the functionality of it. Yes? I also use two other products. Okay. One of them is called MyPaint. MyPaint? All right. Basically mimics real-life paint brushes. Okay. All right. And alchemy. And all right. Shapes, okay. Like all right. And again, it depends largely on, on what you're doing. Um, I typically, I use either the GIMP if I want to do some extensive editing. If I'm just doing something really, really uh, basic, I will just use the Mac preview, the, the preview on the Mac. And, and you can resize images, you can play with the contrast, you, you, can, do, you can do actually a fair amount of stuff pretty easily using that. So if I want to really do something extensive, like if I wanted to, you know, cut out Simba and put him in a jungle background or something elaborate like that, I would use the GIMP. But if I was just maybe changing the size, I would use uh, um, Preview just in, uh, on the Mac. Now, on Windows, kind of the freebie that comes with every Windows machine is Paint. And we'll look at that and and We'll talk about that a little bit, and we'll talk about some general concepts. The only reason I go over paint is like you're guaranteed to have it. You know, Photoshop you might not have if you don't want to fork out a lot of money. All right, uh, the GIMP you might not have if you don't want to wrestle with open source software or whatever. Even though it's not really that hard, but paint if you're running Windows you'll have it. So let's go into paint. And I can get into it a couple different ways. I will go in and find paint this way and open it. I will then go and say file open and go and open my image. And there we go. Now, once we have it open, we can do a number of different things. One of the things that we can do is we can resize it. All right. The bigger an image is, typically the more pixels uh, is going to be, and uh, you know, the bigger physically it is, the more space it's going to take up. It means longer download and so on. So I can go under image, and I can say attributes, and I can go and change the width and the height. Now, this is an old version of Paint. All right, it's a very old version of Paint. Um, one thing that you would want to do when you're changing this is make sure you get the ratio of the height and width the same. All right? Other applications sort of do that for you. But, for example, if I wanted to cut the height in half, I better also cut the width in half. Otherwise, the cat's going to look stretched out or wider, depending on which one. I absolutely hate when I see that on web pages. All right, so please don't do that. If you're editing with photos, keep the rate, that's called the aspect ratio, keep that constant. So in this case, I could say that the width I'll make 112 and the height I'll make 150. That should be both half the height and half the width. That will boil down to being really a quarter of the image, right? Because I'm halving both the height and the width. Oh. I picked the wrong thing. Okay. Undo. Stretch and skew is what I wanted to do. There I go. My, my mistake. It's been ages since I used paint. There we go. And if we were to save this, it would take up less storage. I'm going to go and do a save as, just so that we have both files. And if we look at this, this file was 52 kilobytes. This one will be 6 kilobytes. So really, you got it, got it down a lot smaller. Um, there's absolutely tons more that you can do with this and learn. You know, there's, there's ways of, you know, JPEG is a compressed format and there's the quality, the level of compression you have, all sorts of things. Um, just to, to look at some of this some more, the other thing that we can do is we can, well, not in this version, 
Um, you can you can change the contrast of it so you could make you know a, a bigger difference between the light and dark and so on. Let's see what other photo editing we have on here. Picture manager, yeah. All right. There you go. Brightness and contrast. I can make the picture brighter. Oh, that's better. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. More contrast. I can pick auto brightness. I can change the color. I can give it a, a slightly different tint if I want to. All right. That is useful um, for what's called white balance. Uh, depending on the, the kind of lighting that you, that you take a photograph in, it can have like a, a different cast to it. Like for example, if you take it under a fluorescent light, something that's supposed to be white won't really look white. You can, and you can go and make that adjustment. You can also go in and change the saturation to either punch up the colors or tone down the colors down the black and white. So there's a lot of things that you can do and really the best thing to do is if you have something you're using now just keep on using it. All right. Um, if you don't have anything you use now at the very least use paint to resize it in, in the manner that I described. If you have questions at all I can, can assist it with you. One thing I will say, always keep an original of your image. All right. The reason for that is you can always make an image smaller, but you can't make it bigger without losing quality. So for example, if I were to open up this guy in paint again, the smaller version of Simba, if I were to go and double the size of it, we'll see how obvious this is. It's real easy to see on my screen. It might not be so easy on yours. I'll make it even bigger still. All right. Notice you get what's called pixelation. In other words, yeah, it looks very grainy and all that. So you, you can always go down in size and, and the, the quality should stay fairly consistent. But if you go up in size, uh, there isn't enough information to, to, to create the extra pixels. So it guesses and it doesn't always guess right and you get pixelation. Yes? What's happening when you click on say, a thumbnail or a picture? That, that's, that's behavior. The, the question was is what's going on when you go to open an image and it goes past the edge of the screen. It's bigger than the size of the screen and then after it loads it boom sizes itself correctly. That I believe is behavior built into the browser. That's nothing really that was coded to do that. The browser is smart enough to say look uh, my window is only 800 pixels wide this is a 1200 pixel wide image. It lets it load, then it says, okay, boom, I'm going to shoot it down to, to that. So it loads the full size of the image, and then the browser just makes it smaller to fit in. So the original picture should have been smaller. So fit well, um, the question is, is, well, why didn't the developer just make the, the picture smaller? Number one, maybe they should have, all right. Number two, you never know what kind of monitor someone's going to be running. All right? There could be someone running an, an ancient machine that has only 800 width, right? And there could be other folks running newer machines that have, you know, 1400 uh, width. So you're never quite sure. Or you could have someone that's browsing it on their phone where you only get maybe 480 going across. So it's real tricky to, to gauge for sure. Because, you, you know, the, the, the diff, the, there's differences in the client and you as a web developer don't really know how people are going to be accessing it. So one strategy is to code to the least common denominator and, and guess uh, 
what probably the minimum resolution people are going to have and code to that. Another strategy is, well, I'm going to make the page the way I want it to be, and if their browser, you know, and hopefully their browser, you know, and we'll test to make sure at least it renders it reasonably. Yes? Uh, yes, there is. There, there's, there are some things that you can do via JavaScript um, to look at how big, um, how much space you have available and do some calculation and, and, and size that. Yeah. Um, well, the issue with that is you're still downloading the giant, the big picture. All right. That's why in my mind, if, if you want a picture to appear a certain size on your screen, edit your picture to, to be that. That way that they're, they're downloading that amount of, of bytes. As opposed to um, downloading a giant picture and resizing it to appear smaller. So yes? Well, uh, you, you, have, you have choices for that. You can either do a, a, a pixel size or you can uh, express a percentage and say I want it to be 50%, the width of it to be 50% of the available space. So you can, you can do that via CSS uh, a couple different ways. Yes? I guess it would also determine on what the picture was in the comment. Absolutely. Um, one thing uh, th that I will... In reference to like the cats, you don't need to see every hair on the cat. Right. So if you're trying to like, like one of my hobbies is penny model miniatures. Mm-hmm. Right. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. The, the statement was made is, is like the size that you'd make an image or would you put in any sort of functionality that would resize the image or make it bigger or whatever. All of this depends on the context, on the particular problem you're trying to solve. You know, even the quality of the image, right? If I am simply a person that wants to show my cats to the world, all right. This might be a perfectly good um, image to show my cats to the world. All right. If I was a photographer and I wanted to do a portfolio online to show, hey, I'm a great photographer. I take great pictures of cats. Hire me to take pictures of your cats. I might want a higher quality photo. There's one thing that you'll find in web development which really makes it very intriguing and very interesting is that almost everything that you say about web development isn't really a rule, but it's more of a guideline. All right? I can describe like maybe for like a standard basic um, website for a business, I can de 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 define some guidelines that you'd want to follow. But you can always find exceptions. All right? You know, don't make images too big, all right, is a guideline. But if you're in a situation that the student described where you're painting miniatures and you need to see every single last detail of it, then yeah, you would need a very high quality image to show all that detail. So again, I can talk about some guidelines, but there almost always be exceptions. There's very few things in web development that are like hard and fast rules. Always do this, all right. Uh, because almost anything that you can find, if you try hard enough, you can find an exception. Even something like good navigation, right? Make your navigation clear and obvious. There might be times when you don't want good navigation. Why? Well, why do you think? Why might you want to create a web page that doesn't have good navigation, doesn't have clear, simple navigation? Pardon me? Uh, okay, <laughs> that's a possibility. If there's something that you would, yeah, if you something that information that you have to disclose, but but you don't want to, you could you could hide it some way. That's a possibility. Yes. Um, maybe someone said like adult content. Maybe you would want to make the navigation hard for. Think about like a casino. They don't want to tell you what time it is because they don't want you to leave. Okay. <laughs> Right. 
You may stay logged in all the time. That's with true. Sharing, okay, uh, m maybe they want people to stay on your site. You want to show an example of bad navigation? You want, well, okay, do I show an example of bad navigation? That's kind of a hard one to argue with, yes. Yeah. Uh huh. Right. Uh, one more, and then, then I'll summarize. Come back to that one. Yes. This is just uh, as a tech. You go, you look for drivers. Uh huh. And these pages bury the download link so much. Right. That it is very difficult to actually yeah. find. Uh, someone hit their camera. By the way, I think I think you bumped your. Oh nope. yeah. <laughs> Okay, yeah, uh, th in that case, that's sort of a uh, disingenuous bad navigation. They, they put in extra links so that you have to go through some process and see a bunch of ads before you can finally download the driver. My be the best example I would think of, a lot of the ones that were mentioned are, are true cases, but are sort of like, um, again, people being, people intentionally designing bad for nefarious or semi-nefarious reasons. The example that I like is, is something that's a game. All right, Something that's a game that you go in and you want people to immerse themselves in the website. It's not about going in and finding information you know, like you would if I wanted to find the price of a new laptop. If I want to find the price to a new laptop, I want to go to Dell's site, couple clicks, there it is. Right? Because I want to figure that out and then carry on with the rest of my day, right? You know, I don't want to spend hours on Dell's website. But if I went to a movie website, if I went to a website about the Sherlock Holmes movie, for example, if they kind of made it a little confusing to navigate around the site, that's something you could sort of, in a way, get lost in and have sort of an immersive experience. I'll give a, a good example of this, which was, um, a website that was created to promote the original Halo game. Yeah, again, I'm being careful here. All right, let me refresh this. It's ilovebees.com. If you go to the site, well, let, me, let me open another tab so I, you can see it from the beginning. Oh, here's a nice little site about bees. Wait a minute. What's going on here? Oh my gosh, we're in trouble. Run out of the room screaming. Mission log. What the heck is this about? This is actually part of a viral marketing campaign for the game Halo. All right, when the game Halo came out. And they deliberately made it confusing, and sure enough, in terms of people, gamers posting the bulletin boards and all that, it sort of got attention to it by being intentionally obscure and making people wonder, what's going on here? All right. Now, to be sure, if I was developing a website for Learning Community College, would I take this approach? You know, no. All right, not a good idea. Not a, not a good idea for a standard website. But in a very specialized circumstance, almost anything that you can say about web design, there's an exception to it. And I guess that, that was my point uh, uh, about this. Yes? Uh, recently, Resident Evil, they have a new game coming out. Uh -huh. A couple months ago, I actually did that. OK. Uh, you log on to UmbrellaSciences.com to apply for a job or something like that. Right, right, and right. Somebody on the entire page looks like it's getting hacked. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The, the mention was another game did that more recently, Resident Evil. They've even done that inside the game, too. OK, cool. Out of the Matrix career, it wasn't even that good a game. If you wanted to do any kind of like cheat code or um, drop weapons in a level, or uh -huh. you actually went into a uh, basically looked like uh, a command prompt. Mm -hmm. You would type in like right, code, right. You 
hack the matrix and you put the idea right. in it and you get you know, Right. The point is, is for entertainment purposes, you can do a lot of things that sort of obscure and make things not clear. And again, this isn't standard by any means. And, and the, you know, chances are you're never going to develop a website like this. But the point again is that um, you know, almost any rule is not a hard and fast rule, but a guideline. All right. Uh, and we'll, we'll keep coming to that. And, and, and getting back to images, which started this discussion an hour and a half ago, uh, getting back to images, how big do you make the image? It depends on the problem that you're trying to solve. It depends on what it is you're trying to show and, and, and what's, what's important uh, about it. So it's always important to keep in mind. Um, you should be at least familiar enough with editing software to make a, an image smaller, I guess. But again, always keep the original. All right. Yes. I have a question that's completely off topic. Okay. Um, if SOPA passes, like, how do you think that would affect the web development field? I don't know. know yeah, I know about SOPA. The question is, if SOPA were to pass, uh, how would it affect the web development field? Well, I think people would. I don't know if it would affect the web development field so much as it would affect. Uh, users of the web, general users of the web. Um, content maybe. Yeah, content maybe. So if I'm developing a website for, uh, I mean, I've developed websites for my friends that are artists, okay? I'm using pictures that they gave me. I'm not breaking any copyright law, all right? But, you know, if you're, if you're a, a teen and you post a Justin Bieber video, then, then yeah, then, you know, you get life in prison or something. I don't know. <laughs> Which, well, I don't know. I, I don't want to. I don't want to criticize anyone's musical taste. I say maybe that's appropriate in that particular case. But uh, anyway, uh, so yeah, I don't. I don't know. I, I'm. I'm guessing that it's going down though. There, there's a number of sponsors of the bill that are backing down from it, so it's probably not likely. Yes. So, um, do we do we position the image the same way like you told us for the other stuff? Like you know, like position around the front, like the image. Yeah. Yeah, you put it where you want it to appear, and initially, um, initially we're not going to have a lot of control about that. But we will, we will, as the course goes on, be able to take more and more and more control of that. Usually, probably the best thing to do initially would be to have your image and have a paragraph either above it or below it. Eventually, we'll be able to like, do things like wrap text around the image and all that, but that's getting a little ahead of ourselves. Other questions or comments? All right. What we will do next time, we'll talk about linking between pages that you create as opposed to linking to uh, an external page somewhere else on the web. And we'll also talk about using images just for decorative purposes. In other words, they don't really add content to the page, but maybe we're going to put a little background on the page that, that just makes the page look nicer. Yes? Yeah, like a gradient or something like that. Yeah. All right. See you in lab.